Sponsored by Tropical Acres Steakhouse. Hold the mayo. It's time for Mike Mayo's Lunchbox. Find out what's being served with Mike, Defo, and Luby. The only show that covers food, sports, and the proper maintenance of your car. And now, a man who had the distinction of having an entire health clinic named in his honor, Mike Mayo. I want the flim flam sauce with the awesome bay with Shafafa on the side. Hello, everybody. There's no music today because there's no Luby today. And a day without Luby means a day without music. We're going with the cold open. Welcome to another edition and another week of Mike Mayo's Lunchbox. Kind of just doesn't seem the same without Luby or the Oliver Twist theme music, Food Glorious Food, but uh, we are more than happy to have in his stead. And uh, Jeff D. Foot DeForest, we have all as usual. Carlos Frias is joining us. Uh, for another visit to the lunchbox, uh, of course, I could do a know. I could do a human beatbox if you need some music. Yeah, yeah you can, can do that. Sure, you do go that? ahead. No, right. yeah. I may be in it. Maybe and, I'll close the show that way. And uh, Mike Lubitz is in the Dominican Republic. And how about this for a shocking upset, Jeff Tifo DeForest? There's been no major uh, calamities that, uh, or uh, neither earthquakes, hurricanes, or any other natural disasters that have befallen that country while uh, Luby and Shirley are visiting. That's that's <laughs> quite the shock, right? Well, I mean, he uh, found Sammy Sosa right away at the airport. Uh, turns out he's an airport greeter now. That, that's a big surprise. And <laughs> since then, I, I guess Sammy's a good luck charm because uh, nothing catastrophic has happened while Luby's been in attendance in another country. Well, that's all well and good. Um, meanwhile, Carlos Frias, a man who needs no he needs introduction. no introduction the world over. The great Jimmy Lennon uh, senior used to say, former that. Miami <laughs> Herald food editor, two time winner of the James Beard Award for his. Uh, prolific and insightful writing. And Wait a yes, minute, he has two beards? Yeah, he's got two beards. He's the bearded You, uh, you, you were in on a Pulitzer, man. though, at one time. I, I guess I've that, won that you some the share of some yeah. awards, but I've never won a okay. beard award. And yes, I am completely jealous. I'm filled yeah. with um, just nothing, but uh, I, I, I covet the man's awards. What can I say? Uh, but Listen, there was a year that, that you beat me out for uh, a, a food writing award, and I was second. I was second fiddle to you, and I was, uh, and I was, right. I, I was seething with jealousy, but also very <laughs> happy for you because you're a good guy. So he, thanks. Well, he was gunning for me just the same way that Ian Eagle has been gunning for Jim Nance, and uh, man, he did. Both of them did a good job, and uh, Nance at the Masters. That's where he shines, and Ian Eagle. What'd you think of his whole performance on the NCA? Is there a defo? That's your buddy, right? Your sir. Oh, brilliant! Columbia. Yeah, no, the guy's great. Uh, you know, it, it's so weird because he, he doesn't look like uh, he would have the kind of personality that he displays when when he's on uh, certain talk shows. I, I I don't know that he always uh, does this, but uh, he, he's been great with us over the years. It's only a matter of time. You, you'll hear the Masters music, da, 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 and uh, you'll hear uh, Ian Eagle saying, "Hello, friends." <laughs> and there'll be a chalk outline of Jim Nance somewhere around 16. But uh, no, he, he's definitely a coming star if he wasn't there already. And number two team in the NFL. And only a matter of time before he's number one in everything. Well, Carlos is like us, uh, Defoe. He also has a sports background. I yes. think he first came up at the Sentinel as like an intern. Is that Do I have that correct? And I think I was already there on staff. And I was in such a uh, fog back then. I, I never came into the office, but I, I do remember Carlos was there for a stretch. Is that right? Do I have any? Yeah, I was, I was an intern in 1996. Uh, and the, the staff included, you were the columnist, the sports columnist at the time, uh, Hyde. Hyde was there, of course. Rachel Alexander was the the hockey writer, was the the Panthers writer. Dave Hyde obviously is is an institution, right. uh, so he was there. And uh, Jason Cole, throwback throwback name, Jason Cole. He still does that, the Defo Morning Show very uh, uh, frequently. No, nobody yeah. played the internet game better than Jason Cole. Yeah, yeah. He, he was the Neil O'Donnell of free agents uh, when it came to uh, th this uh, whole new media ride that uh, is taking place. But uh, yeah, he, he's always getting the best new job that's available. It's incredible, it's fantastic. I would say Fred Turner was a fantastic sports editor. He's the guy that gave me my first my first break. God uh, bless I, his soul. It's been yeah. 13 years since he's Fred departed. Turner. Yeah, we love Fred. God, could he spot talent or what? That's a guy who discovered Mitch Album. Uh, Gene Wojciechowski, uh, Bill Plaschke, uh, of course, Dave Hyde. Uh, guys. About Steve Hummer. Remember Steve that guy? Hummer? Hummer. Oh, oh man. He was Atlanta one of the greats fame. in Atlanta yes. then afterwards. Yeah. yeah he, he always wore the uh, Joe Paterno flood pants, though. Do you remember that about Steve Hummer? Yeah, Anybody ever remember. comment uh, on that around the office? 
No, I was a little short. Yeah. So it's funny you mentioned Rachel Alexander, of course, now Rachel Nichols, a huge star of uh, the small screen in terms of sports journalism. And uh, we won't mention that back then we were having a, a torrid under the rug. Uh, now, we were dating at the time. Wow. That's it. Wow. Um, I guess we I guess we are going to mention that. <laughs> You know, there, there are pictures of uh, Rachel with a young Mayo. It, it, quite impressive, I, I would have to say, Carlos. Yeah, wow, I she was... had Mayo on the side. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good one. The little so, packets, of course. Like, so, you know. I go to the penalty box for that. And I get five minutes for yeah. that one. Uh, but anyway, she is uh, very, very talented and has risen to great heights. Whereas here I am on the lunchbox, viewed by dozens of people. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> More prestigious to... show, though, than uh, – <laughs> and plus, she's a human kiss of death. Every NBA player she interviews uh, ends up going into the tank, uh, needing surgery. Oh, no. It's absolutely the truth. That's I mean, uh, she sits oh, down no. with these guys. They end up uh, – they may as well retire right on the spot. It's over. <laughs> saying the human jinx. It's like the yes. SI cover. Uh, Through jinx. no fault of her own. I'm sure a very lovely young lady inside and out. But uh, nonetheless, uh, human kiss of death. You, you don't want to sit down with this gather. woman one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. One of the <laughs> most talented and uh, knowledgeable sports journalists out there today. Hardest absolutely. working, again. Uh, Carlos is hard. I like that Mayo comes up with the cleanup disclaimer whenever we <laughs> condemn somebody as being a kiss hey, You know, I'm a gentleman. Us. I always got to Oh, yeah, very talented. <laughs> um, speaking of things we shouldn't mention, I just, look, all I'm going to say is that Carlos has been in the news, not just covering the news. Oh, um, yeah, wow. Well. Because, uh, you know, he was at a uh, local radio station that uh, where he no longer is. And, uh, uh, look, I'm all I'm going to say is this, because under the advice of his attorney, he shouldn't comment on it. I don't want to ask him about it. All I know is this, Jeff DeFoto Forrest, speaking as one who knows, yes, it's much better to be a plaintiff in a civil case than a defendant in a federal criminal case. Uh, not that anybody here would, would know about that, right? Well, what, what would... Uh... What what happened? I mean, I'm curious about this. What radio? I mean, station? I mean, uh, Google exists. I was yes. last employed. Just I was last in, employed by just, WLRN. Uh, for, yeah, uh, for, just for, all you gotta do WLRN. is Google Carlos Frias and NPR station or WLRN, much in the same way. They fire can, people at WLRN. <laughs> It's just what's it's not public getting, radio. It's, it's, it's like getting it's, canned from Radio Marti. What are we? All I'm gonna about say here? is this, Carlos. It, you can be as, recommend as many uh, Latin South American restaurants as you want. You could break into Spanish and speak full Spanish if you want. Sometimes me and Defo go full Yiddish here, and, and it's great when you don't have uh, any bosses or oversight. Uh, it's good. You can't get canned. muchas gracias, señores. <laughs> that's it. Estoy contento uh, de estar aquí con ustedes, con it. el gran Magmeyo y el gran Defo, <laughs> conocido por por todo sur, el sur de la Florida. Imagine that somebody in the 305 is a little bit maybe upset or mystified that something might be too Latino. But anyway, we're not getting into it. Get I don't want to drag you in. He, you know, again, I, I'm going to put a parenthetical. I had to involve some kind of, uh, I mean, uh, no, program director. Google it. Of Google it. Google some it. Some kind of evil nature. Google you know? it just in the same way you could Google Jeff DeForest and Mikasuki Tribe. And the way you can Michael, you can Google Michael Mayo and Eagle Scout. No, Michael Mayo and Citizens Property Insurance. You could find that all kinds of things through the magic of Google. Why, why, are you, why are you mucking through the dirt here, Mayo? We have food to talk about. <laughs> Carlos I actually brought <laughs> topical material for a change. We're, and, transferred and were, to the, we're from the dirt to the dirt cup. You know, he's we'll, face down in the gutter, dessert. this kid. I mean, what's, what's wrong with him? <laughs> I know. He's good. Carlos is going to obviously uh, land on his feet. He's so talented, and I am very happy to have him. He spent a day with us. Uh, I, you know, my brain is so – I don't know if it's the dementia, drugs, alcohol – where were we a couple of weeks ago? We did a show together, and uh, I we're at Gilbert's. We're at Gilbert's. Gilbert's. Yeah, and we, we ate Gilbert's. our way through that restaurant. Gilbert's threw the menu at us, and we came out the other side. Right. That was when uh, Defoe's dog was having hemorrhoids or something. And uh, oh, poor how's, guy, girl, how's Skippy Whatever. doing by the way. Skippy's uh, doing well. I mean, uh, Skippy, we don't know his exact age. Uh, we've had him almost ten years. And they told us he was three when we adopted him uh, from the rescue place. And he probably, every vet that we took him to uh, said he was probably six or seven. So th this dog could be 16, 17 years old. And he's, pr he's still pretty spry. He's going to have an occasional uh, foul up. But uh, he's in the general, El Duque Hernandez really, really good. Of, of dogs. He really is. Yeah. <laughs> he has that salsa, you know, slider also that doesn't break 87 <laughs> miles an hour, but gets everybody out. Imagine that. I mean, that was. Uh, Kind of like Mariano Rivera. Imagine being a superstar and you only have one pitch and everybody knows it's coming. 
And uh, but it yeah. comes from eight different angles. Exactly. <laughs> right. And, and, and he may have the same age uh, kind of uh, discrepancies uh, that uh, El Duque had on his birth certificate also. Because uh, okay. I, I think this dog, is, he, he could be zeroing in on 20. It's amazing. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it is amazing. What's also amazing is I'm a little bit um, I'm scared now. I don't see anybody on the chat line. And usually there's a couple of people that are, are tuning in. But uh, I, I guess maybe, uh, well, you know what? The show will just go on. Maybe it's fine. Luby that has the magic they'll, fingers that just. They'll find it people. afterwards. Or it's yeah. just the three of us. It's yep. fine. No. And maybe I'm hitting oh, the wrong Connie, buttons. Connie Yogle is watching. Was well, shout out to Connie Yogle, the, the my oh, yeah. food editor, the current food editor. She's uh, she is currently saying she's cracking up. She's okay, like, you didn't that, say you were going to be on Mayo's show. I'm hey Connie, I'm on Mayo's show. There he is, right this there. This is good. There's <laughs> Let me over. see if I could see any. There goes another job, Carlos. Anywhere so. <laughs> else? Um, well, maybe I'm just kind of a little bit uh, technologically challenged. But let's get into some food talk, Carlos. Um, I think, you know, you are down in the 305 and you guys are either blessed or cursed with uh, having the Michelin guide inspectors come through your town with their little monocles and handkerchiefs that they drop to the floor to see how quickly they get picked up. Or I don't know. Do you know anybody who is a Michelin guide uh, raider inspector? It's one of the most mysterious things, I guess, on the planet. And I'm yeah. a little bit offended that they haven't asked me yet. I gotta be yeah. Honest. You know what? It's it's. um. It's such a black box how restaurants get chosen or valued or evaluated for it. That's really hard to, you know, we have we put such great uh, emphasis and importance on like being a Michelin rated restaurant or Michelin. It started as Michelin star restaurant, right? Now it's right. Michelin approved or Michelin. Right. The Biba included. Gourmands. It's like yeah. the, the participation trophies for those that don't. And then there, and then there's an included in the guide and, and people are mystified. And I tell them. Well, of course you have those categories because it's not an award. It's a guide. They're they're trying to sell, at one point, a physical guide. Uh, and I think they still do that. But it's also, they, a thing. they want you to go to their website. You can't have a guide without restaurants in it. So, uh, you know, uh, how, 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 uh, how hard do you want to close that door? You know, well, the, how hard do you want to make it to open or close that door? You know, at one point they were trying to sell tires because it's Michelin tires and it started off as a guidebook in France for people who would travel around the country hunting for great cuisine. Uh, at the now, time when only a few people could afford the automobile <laughs> or a terrible French accent. Or the gasoline, which is, what, $15 a liter or something. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's back there right now. You, yeah. Still, you can't afford to drive in Europe. Uh, but, yeah, it was like for the elite. Like, where shall I take my newfangled horseless carriage? Well, here's a, a book where you can stop, you know, uh, on your way to the uh, to the polo grounds or whatever. Well, we had uh, an equivalent. You know, we had an equivalent here in the States. It was called the Mobile Guide. And I remember, uh, do you remember this, Defo? That in the 70s, when I would travel with my family on vacations to California, we would pick up this Mobile Guide uh, and uh, with the gas company. And, uh, and we would look through uh, of which places we should check out, which ones are more affordable and friendly, family friendly. And it was a pretty useful guide that had some, you know, you could assure yourself that there was some quality in there. Um, that just fell by the wayside. And now Michelin is just dominating the space. And it's pay for play in a way. I don't know. But uh, Tifa, did you ever? Uh, uh, the guy, yeah, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> my brother was uh, one of the reviewers for that guy. Really? At one time, yeah. My brother, uh, who, who uh, you know, carries the same kind of uh, intellectual uh, weight level that you do, uh, Mike Mayo, a very intelligent guy. And uh, he he had this job very briefly. He loved it. Uh, where, I mean, imagine this concept. You two guys can relate. Where, where you go to restaurants and essentially eat on somebody else's dime. <laughs> and uh, then you give your opinion. And I think you're right, uh, Mike Mayo. It, it wasn't like Yelp, where you have a bunch of screaming maniacs and uh, there's an agenda there. It, it was... Uh, very straightforward, honest depiction uh, that was given by their critics, and and it was useful because uh, you could, much like with Let's Eat South Florida, you could find some places that you would really like to try or that uh, you otherwise would have been unaware of, and, and and especially if you were traveling, it, it was really really a good thing. I like yeah. to call it fancy Yelp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and let's Yelp. get before we get into the nitty gritty of who's going to make it or who might fall off this year. Um, and just to people to clue people in briefly, Michelin comes into certain areas in the United States where they get money from local tourism boards. In the case of Florida, 
the state is chipping in a little bit, as well as the local tourism boards in Miami-Dade County, Orange County, which is Orlando area, along with the Tampa-St. Pete area. Now, the funny part you mentioned about, like, now they have all these other things to fill the guide, things that aren't getting the stars, which are the highest of the high, but also notable places. And that's because, somewhat embarrassingly, the Tampa people paid the money the first year and then were uh, very thrilled to discover that none of their restaurants got awarded Michelin stars. Um, <laughs> something, yeah, which is, I guess, you pay the man and take your chances. Uh, but uh, <laughs> how much of a game changer is it if uh, you oh, get awarded I mean, one of these? Stars? It, it can be. It, it can be a huge boon because, right? Like, there's people. There are people who make it sport to dine out at Michelin starred restaurant. So go around the world, can, like yeah. all over the world. Yeah. So being on that guide is, uh, I mean, restaurateurs will tell you that they look at the receipts before and after and they can see it. So in that sense, it's a huge advertising push. I think, I think the danger comes when you start, you know, start believing your own hype, you know, uh, about what it means in the grand scheme. Like you have to keep everything in, you know, kind of in perspective. Was your restaurant good before, you know, or wasn't it? You know, is it only after a star that you feel you know uh, um, kind of a, a proven right by by what you're doing? But so I think if you take it as like this is a fantastic boon for your business, like they definitely want that because it definitely shows up. Uh, all the awards really do that. You know, if you win uh, a you know food and wine a James best Beard new award, chefs, maybe you get offers that you wouldn't ordinarily get. Yeah, yeah. So so for yeah. restaurants and writers and all. Yeah, no, I mean, it's true. Those those things do bring people to your restaurant. So in that sense, if you told me the number one economic driver, one of the top economic drivers in Florida is tourism and like dining being a part of that. And, you know, the state of Florida says, you know, we're, we're going to invest a million and a half bucks in this, which is the minimum that they spent. That's that's as much as I could prove in my reporting back in the day uh, that all that the state and all the local um, tourism boards spent a million and a half bucks is like. That's that doesn't that's not even change that gets lost between the cushions, you know, for they the state. So. Pitbull like eight million, right, or something. Yeah, like to like that. rap about it or like make booty <laughs> music about it. And I don't hate I don't hate on Pitbull, but I think this is money better spent, really. How, how does uh, Zagat? I, it used to be a big thing to have a Zagat uh, approval oh, or whatever. Zagat. And I they put the Zagat. stamp in there, and it was kind of like an Italian restaurant uh, that existed without having a picture of Vito Anafermo by the door, because uh, th this Zagat <laughs> thing, uh, you know, it kind of stamped you as being legitimate. Uh, is that still uh, of a critical nature in the restaurant game? It's faded I, away. Yeah. Well, you know who owns it now is uh, the Infatuation. Uh, okay. If you've seen that website, the Infatuation, uh, our buddy down here, Ryan Pfeffer, is the Miami guy. He's a and, great uh, writer, by the way. He reminds me of myself when it comes to reviews. Although I'm still mystified by why the Infatuation pretends that chefs don't exist and don't have names. But that's a, another topic for another day. All their reviews, they never mention who the chef is. It would be like assessing a Picasso painting without mentioning Picasso. But I sidetracked you. Anyway, but go on. Yeah, the Infatuation. Also, Chase Bank, I think, is the overall owner or partner with the Infatuation and Zagats now. But, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. They and, tried to, they pitched me. They were like, when I was still writing about that, oh, the, we're bringing back Zagat. And I remember writing something about it. Oh, we're going to bring back Zagat. And and it came back in some form. And then no one has, it has not been seen or heard from. Uh, yeah, I, I they, hear the Long Island press is coming back too, right? <laughs> so, uh, Miami Times or what's the <laughs> yeah. New Times? New Times. Oh, the Miami the News. The Miami News. News. The Miami News is the one of the great newspaper. Yeah. By the way. Another great, another yeah. great paper for for a lot of uh, paper for, for a lot sports. of great sports writers. That was a great yeah. sports paper. Um, but speaking of Zagat, why the heck would anybody come up with a rating system that's between the numbers one and thirty? Does anybody ever understand what how they did that? Uh, I don't know. Because Zagat, remember, they would have three components: food, service, atmosphere. And it was on a instead of a one to ten scale or five star scale, it was thirty points. So the best for each one was thirty. It was mystifying and it That's made odd. it a little bit unique. But uh, such are the vagaries of the rating books. Um, you know, the overall knock on Michelin is that they are too skewed towards high end fine dining. That they are too skewed towards European and now high end omakase and Japanese experiences. And are not so open to uh, the mid range or awarding stars. And again, I've had some excellent meals at mid range places in Broward that would not el be eligible for stars because they just 
they require a certain level of build out and atmosphere that you have to spend at least two or three million dollars on your build out as opposed to a little storefront where you make it exceptional food uh, that in my mind might be star worthy. And I'm thinking of a place uh, called Shamuja, which is the ramen joint out in Southwest ranches. You, you former... didn't say that right. Uh, Shamuja. <laughs> Go ahead. Give him, give him the real pronunciation. Shamuja. Uh, Ooh, Kiji. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Former sponsor. Like one, of the original, Karen came to the plate. one of the original sponsors of the lunchbox. And I just think he does a great job. Uh, I think his product is Michelin worthy. Of course, being in Broward, he'll never get a star because uh, the inspectors are not coming to Broward yet. And I don't know if they're going to rectify that but in any know. event uh i don't know if they're thinking about miami is like miami dade county because this is miami and like really the city of miami a lot of those restaurants aren't in the city of miami proper some of them are yeah. but uh but so i think that they're maybe that leaves them open to it right uh i think it's got to be coming the tourist bureau is the uh was it the greater miami convention and visitors bureau so greater right. miami in comp they're paying they're paying the money right they're paying yeah. the money so it's like you guys better now you know, visit here. Lauderdale and Stacy yeah. Ritter. I know she's expressed interest in it, but I don't know where they stand in terms of if they're afraid of paying the money and not getting enough bang for the buck. Um, because, you know, really, when it comes right down to it, what is a Michelin starred place in Broward? Does Broward have one? Um, I, I, have you been dining up here enough to know to, to assess that situation? You know, as, as, as I have not, but I can say sometimes just a reputation on a place will bring attention to it. Like a guy like Timon Ballou, I think if I was a Michelin person, I'd be paying attention to whatever he was doing. The guys who did Drinking Pig open an oyster b restaurant. I was there on, this in morning. Hollywood? Yes. Oh, oh, look was, at you ahead of the game. I was talking to Raheem and the owner, Caesar. I want us to get in. I want to be involved with that because he does a great job. And um, we're hopefully going to have a lunchbox show there sometime oh, next month. Very and, good. Very good. Now, see, that place I'm excited about. And yeah. and Hollywood does get its, its share, though I'm worried about them on that Harrison Street. There's that one particular street, it's like eight. just off south of Hollywood Boulevard, that there was a, a restaurant there. I don't know if it was called Lola's. I forget what it was. Lola's was, was that it? L Lola's. Michael was, Wagner was the show, Michael's right? Kitchen. It was called. No, there was another Michael. Oh yeah, uh, there was a couple, and that was a different. That was called Mike. Very Michael's popular back something. in the day yeah. when they first yeah. uh, kind of redeveloped that area. Michael's like, Kitchen, think, excellent restaurant. And the guy ended up in Sunrise somewhere. I, yeah, I, I don't know what happened to he, him, but he, uh, he, he really was really putting on I a great show. I think he's involved in that I Heart Mac and Cheese chain, uh, but he also, well, I don't want to make any allegations here, but I know a lot of people who weren't happy with him who were invested. Some in unscrupulous in activity. Oh, or something now you don't like want to talk yeah. about legalities. <laughs> I see. Turn on us, I Carlos. See. <laughs> Um, well, we can talk about many things. Hey, so yeah, you're right. JNC is promising. I know I love Evelyn's at the Four Seasons. Um, I think uh, that chef Brandon Solomon, very talented, and it's a Mediterranean Israeli cuisine. I think they're Michelin worthy. I think uh, the the place below it, I have not been. It's one of these frou frou places called Moss, but I've been hearing very good things about that in Broward. And uh, regrettably, Valentino, my friend Giovanni who is no longer there, but the one meal that I did eat there in the six weeks that he was there was exceptionally good and probably Michelin quality. Uh, I guess the, the question is now, like, are chefs opening places with, you know, it's the same thing in journalism where some people get assigned projects that are just aiming for awards and Pulitzers. Like, chefs now, some of them are opening places just strictly to win Michelin stars. And I'm thinking yeah. of our friend, Michelle Bernstein. She's about to open a place in Coral Gables. And from some of the food that I sampled at her preview dinner at uh, the Hard Rock in the fall, it seemed like she was going for Michelin type dishes. Um, is that a danger for chefs? I mean, anything's a trap, right? Like how many, how many editors do you know in journalism that say we're going to win a Pulitzer this year and we're going to, Look for the story that we're going to pour all our resources into. I mean, I think anytime you make an award, you create an incentive to want to win it. Um, I I don't I, I think Michelle Bernstein is I'm not going to I think she's above that. I think she's okay. above that. I think that she's think maybe I, a queen. Is anybody mm. above it? I mean, every yeah. year I wrote with mind of like knocking you off the pedestal and winning a James Beard writing award. But uh, I don't know. It's something in the resume. She's won the Beard Award. Why wouldn't she want to try to get a she's Michelin such a, star? She's such a big star, though. You know, right. She Why do you need shows? It? And I don't. I, yeah, I mean, maybe. But I, I think that if she opens a restaurant of the caliber that even 
the original Mitchies was, uh, I think that's an instant one star restaurant. Seeing what the other that. ones are, I think it's an instant one star restaurant. Like even her, the restaurant that she that she doesn't own, she's technically her husband owns it, the La, La Trova mm -hmm. Cafe uh, on on yeah, Gallocho. It's like Martinez. One of the, yes. Yeah. No, the new place is, is a is a Senora Martinez. Okay, which is named after his mom, I guess, because he's Martinez. But so that the food at that bar has no business being as good as it is. Oh, like okay. it, it doesn't have to be that great because the drinks are great and they put on they have you know a live band that comes on and plays old Cuban classics at La Trova, and then the food is just. It's it's exactly as good. I, I've never as been in be. there. I, I feel so ashamed. Maybe I got oh, to. I want to get in there at some point. It a was, Thursday yeah. night. Go yeah. on a Thursday night because that's when they start live music, and it has you haven't gotten the the insanity of like Friday night and also happy hour. Their happy hour is actually really good. So if you get in like in happy hour tail end, you'll catch some of the music. You'll have some food. You have some drinks, and then you can catch them when they crank up the music at seven. Uh, and it's like it's good. really cool. Sounds like a good night. Hey, we're going to talk more about the Michelin stars and which places that have them should keep them and which might be getting them. Again, I think the uh, reveal is either Thursday or Friday night. Uh, I'm not sure where it's the being 18th, the year. 18th, 18th. Would They're doing it in Tampa, Tampa. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's going to imagine be if they do it in Tampa and they don't get any new stars. Uh, don't they automatically have to give one to Burns and Mom's Minas? No, they didn't give Burns any. The they don't give it to Joe's. They just included Joe's Stone Crab in the guide as noteworthy. And I think that's wrong. I think Joe's Stone Crab, for what it does, the it, it deserves to be a one star place because I it think is... at least, at least, uh, well, not at least. I, I think one star is appropriate for that place one because star it's is what it's a internationally renowned icon that is unique there's no other restaurant in the world that has made its bones on just one dish stone crab right. but they have other things and just it is quintessential you know south florida miami experience that you have to go to miami beach to joe's schmear your way past the maitre d's it's always at the end never the beginning and uh and get is that why i ended up by the men's room that's it. I gave the guy a 20 when I walked in. This is 40 years ago. And, it's an uh, insult. Know, next thing you know, I'm listening to the toilet flush all night. Insult. You, you don't have to. There's a system in place. My cousin Felipe, uh, he, um, uh, one of the partners is is uh, has like an in with the Mater D, and he's and he got him, you know, seated. So when he when he shows up, he's like, I have to make sure to tip the ma the the captain very right. well because it's going to reflect on the senior partner so it's like he's not just tipping the guy he's tip he's tipping to make sure that his his, that his partner keeps his connection yeah regard yeah. and i you know i was cued into the ways early when i was just a, a cub sports writer uh, but i was schooled on you don't go to the main maitre d at the time it was roy who had his little toy poodle uh he ended up working at uh, the uh, steakhouse across the street, uh, uh, Smith and Walensky's. But uh, you would go off to the side, and first I would see Dennis, rest in peace. He became head Metro D at one point. But you would see Dennis, talk to him a little bit, and then on the way out, surreptitiously slip him. And for me, it was always $10 a head. If I went with a four top, it was $40. This was back 25 years ago. That's from, that's real money. But, uh, yeah, always on the way out, always with the just very, very uh, surreptitious handshake. Uh, I love Joe's. I think it belongs as a one-star, but uh, I, I think doubt so that it'll get the recognition. All right, hey, uh, I got to talk about a place that I think should be a bib gourmand if the Michelin star guide ever came to Broward, and that is a place that's near and dear to my heart. Tropical Acres Steakhouse. It's a Tropical Acres Tuesday, and that means half price wine night. Go into Tropical Acres tonight and get yourself a beautiful bottle of wine for half price. That's lower than you get it in some of the discount liquor stores around town. And better yet, go in there during the happy hour, 4 30 to 6 30. You get half price cocktails in the bar. $8 Belvedere martinis. Can't beat that. Some of the great. Light bites uh, on the happy hour menu for reasonable prices. And then if you want, you just sachet your way into the main dining room to get that beautiful prime rib or filet mignon or some of the great seafood that they have. Uh, and don't forget, Mother's Day is coming up before you know it. It's, it's Sunday, May 12th. They will be open that Sunday, 1 to 8 p.m. Give them a call, Tropical Acres, 954-989-2500 for your reservations now for Mother's Day or any day. 
except the usual Sundays. They're open Monday through Saturday during the week. They're celebrating their 75th anniversary this month. Go in there, have a cocktail, raise a glass, and say cheers, salute, Chentani to our friends, the Studiales at Tropical Acres. Tell them the lunchbox sent you. On the iconic front, I mean, they deserve a Michelin star, don't they? 75 years. And uh, I, still doing uh, everything right. Uh, and, you know, when I go in there on the half-price wine night, I actually end up ordering like a case of Sonoma Couture because it's uh, saving me money in the long run, uh, bringing half of the, uh, bringing uh, all of those bottles home. All right, we're coming back with more. Uh, it's a pleasure, an honor, really needing no introduction the world over. You were right. Carlos Free is uh, with us here from the Miami Herald, uh, outstanding food critic. <laughs> and back with more of Mike Mayo's Lunchbox in a moment. Food from a scratch kitchen, delicious drinks and house-made spirits from a craft bar, a great vibe inside and out with a spacious patio. I'm talking about Batch New Southern Kitchen and Tap, Fort Lauderdale, in the heart of the city at 525 North Federal Highway. It's open seven days for lunch, dinner, and weekend brunch with classics like fried chicken and waffles and shrimp and grits and creative items like pecan-crusted salmon and a fried green tomato BLT. And the drinks? Smooth sipping and so good. There's convenient free parking and a garage next door. Happy hour at the bar, an entire patio, four to seven Monday to Friday, and live music every Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. It's pet and people friendly and with cozy fire pits for when the temperature dips. For reservations and more information, go to BatchSouthernKitchen.com. Hey, it's Mayo here for Delaware Chicken Farm and Seafood Market. Since 1951, for over 70 years, the home of freshness. I've been a customer for over three decades, and it's the place to go for poultry, steaks, meats, and, of course, their unbelievable selection of fish and seafood. They've got it all. Key West pink shrimp, grouper, snapper, lobster, and, of course, Florida stone crab claws of all sizes. Don't forget their famous fish dip and a full selection of prepared foods. It's located at 4191 North State Road 7 in Hollywood, just across from the Seminole Classic Casino. Doug Carter and crew will take great care of you. Make sure to check out their weekly specials and daily catch online at DelawareChicken.com. Quality, value, freshness, that's the Delaware way. Tell them Mike Mayo and the Lunchbox sent you. If you like seafood in a comfortable setting, outdoors, even keel fish shack at the corner of A1A and Commercial Boulevard in Lauderdale by the Sea, and also now with a new location on Las Olas Boulevard. Those are my spots. Upscale food and a down-home setting. The chef owners, Dave and Brad, do a terrific job with all the seafood classics that you want. They have the best grilled oysters in town, bang-bang shrimp, lobster rolls, and and daily fish specials. They also have weekend brunch Saturday and Sunday. They have daily happy hour, four to seven. And they also have other weekly specials like mussels on Monday and oysters on Tuesday. Go to Even Keel Fish Shack and tell them that the lunchbox sent you. All right, we're back on the lunchbox. No music today. We are the low, no frills, stripped down version. Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, well, the, the Luby's having a great time in the Dominican Republic, and we will be back. We will see him again on Thursday at Delaware Seafood Market. That's going to be a fun show. We're going to see uh, if, uh, well, let me ask Carlos Frias this before you get back into the Michelin star uh, discussion. Um, Jeff DeFoe DeForest, scarred from youth, uh, is his Brooklyn childhood. He refuses to eat gefilte fish ever again. Uh, have you ever gone to a Passover Seder, and have you eaten gefilte fish or chopped liver, Carlos Frias? I have been at a Seder. I have not had gefilte fish. Uh, I've had the chopped know? liver, okay. but I have not had the gefilte fish. Do you know what gefilte fish is? Uh, it's like a kind of like a preserved, like a codish, kind of like a, like a bacalao type of thing. It's it's a mystery fish. It's just it's they carp, all the it? scraps. It's like they take carp. some they carp. They catch it out of, in like dirty lakes. I think it's ah, carp. Yeah. I think sometimes they blend a couple of other things. It's like the hot dogs of uh, the Seder, of, of, a, oh. of Jewish food. It's like you don't really want to know what's in there, but if you kind of get it, 
and it's uh, nicely prepared, and you put that great jelly on top and some of the purple horseradish. It's got to be the red horseradish, never the white. Uh, okay. And you put it on a piece of matzo. Mm, that is some living right there. I mean, it, you didn't it, really the, sell it on the hot dog of fish, yeah. but 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 it, you it's came the back. jelly at the bottom of the jar, though, Carlos. I mean, <laughs> is that not the ultimate turnoff? When this thing just has this ugly gel, like something you pulled out of the refrigerator that's been in there for like two years and has a little growth coming out of it. But, uh, you know, that was enough to alienate me, alienate me. And my well, mother was a huge advocate of this stuff. So all I know uh, is we're around going, all the time. We're going to our great <coughs> sponsors at Delaware on Thursday. They make their own house-made gefilte fish, which let me tell you, it's like night and day. It's so It would almost better. be worth a try. Um, for me, even. it's it tastes like a, a vibrant, fresh thing and not something that's been sitting in a jar collecting dust for two years. Uh, and I don't know if they have jelly oh, uh, there. Th this hit me, though, uh, Michael. And uh, I don't know if Carlos is in on this. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, being a food critic in Miami, you, you experience this. But has the price of matzahs skyrocketed to some level that almost uh, looks absurd? Are they like $20 a box now? What's Only the at Publix. If you go to... Your big box stores of Costco and BJ's. I know I saw the five pounds of matzah. You have to buy enough to feed the entire country of Israel, though. Well, here's the Costco. thing. You get no. those five pound boxes in one shot. It's like eleven dollars instead of whatever they're charging at Publix now. But I saw like 20 bucks. Uh, I, I was still thinking, have, how many matzahs are there for 20 bucks? I still bucks? have two from last year and one from the year before sitting yeah. in my cupboard. I think I'm going to try to see if last year's matzahs are completely stale or if they're passable. Like, I don't or take them to the beach and see if they work as a Frisbee first and then <laughs> and consider eating them. I, I don't know. But uh, didn't that, seem, uh, that didn't surprise you, the, the price of matzahs? I, I guess... Nothing yeah. surprises me about the price of items at Publix. It wow. was outrageous, but you can find it better, uh, cheaper pricing uh, at other places. Again, first night of Passover coming up. Uh, it's uh, next Monday. The 22nd is the first night. It's first Seder night. So we'll be uh, celebrating and uh, getting ready uh, Thursday at Delaware. All right, back. So is, 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 is gefilte fish like... I'm thinking of like pigs. Feet. I'm glad you won't like, let this go because pigs, uh, yeah, because I was going to say like discussion. I yeah. I think so too, uh, because like I'm not I'm not aware of it, so I want to hear more about it. But like pigs feet for me as a kid, my dad loved it, and I was I was re repelled, repulsed yeah. by it. I mean, now I've come to appreciate it, but oh, really? wow. like the idea of like uh and and you know and chicken feet are like that too, oh. where you kind of just the, suck the jelly off them. Oh, you oh no oh, no. Man. Uh, but what about the ones in the jar at the uh, convenience store? Oh, oh that's the you big, ever... that's... Is that the big eggs or the like? The, uh, like that pickles are... pig's feet that are bread, and, and the guy goes in there with a pair of tongs, and, and then the people are particular about. No, no, not that one. Uh, that one over there. And you're like, what difference oh. does it make? It's all disgusting. Uh, yeah, I mean, anything <laughs> that's glowing incandescent red in a big jar at yeah. the front of a gas station. I just uh, it makes me think of. Uh, the time I spent near Chernobyl one time. You're thinking if the taquitos have been on that rolling grill for three days, what are the chances that these pig's feet are actually fresh? Uh, you yeah, know, no. good enough to eat. But like I, fresh cooked pig's feet like out of the pot, like now I appreciate it, especially like over rice and you pull it over and everything else. So maybe there's, I'm, I have hope that, that like the gefilte fish connoisseurs out there have like a, Excellent yeah, no, no. preparation I, of them. See, I love these these cultural things, you know, that you grew up with that, you know, people not from that culture would always make a face. Like, I, I love chopped liver. And, you know, now it's the fancy places have liver pate. There's a really good version at our friends at Even Keel and also uh, Pushkar Marath up at Stage up in Palm Beach Gardens does a I love that place. Pate. Oh, yeah. it's. I love um, that place. I love that guy. I love him. Both of the restaurants of his that I've been to, yeah, like Stage, I was like, it was, it's why it, does this would, place exist? And he, like, that deserves a Michelin star, and he deserves really does. A James Beard recognition. So he, uh, he really does good. Good, I got us out of the gefilte trap, and we're back into Michelin. <laughs> hey, you were mentioning about places you like it, other people uh, do. I mean, it, it's obviously very commonly, uh, you know, served and sold. Uh, but uh, yeah, for me, I mean, uh, I'm out on that. Uh, same thing with schmaltz herring, uh, such any a, kind of herring and uh, you know cream sauce. Uh, it's disgusting. such a specific dish. White like people fish. Eat, people eat chopped liver for all the major Jewish holidays. And you can eat chopped liver year long, and I put it on my turkey sandwiches, much to the horror and dismay of these guys when we go to grandpa's. Uh, I, I don't think Carlos does these disgusting things uh, though. I mean, he he's not into He's like uh, you know being a daredevil. He puts guy. pineapple on pizza. He does do that. 
He does do but, that. But, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I, I'm sure he does it with a grace and distinction that defies you uh, smearing chopped liver really over good. a cream cheese sandwich. I mean, it what looked, the heck? No, over a turkey sandwich. Yeah, all right. That was a thing where I grew up. <laughs> now, Carlos, we, before we get into it, he, he posts his pizzas. He's a, a terrific home cook and pizza maker. And he made a... What was it? Uh, what was on that thing? Pineapple and, and a ham, or a, uh, like a uh... yeah, yeah. We did like uh, we did prosciutto, so like prosciutto, and then fresh pineapple because pine fresh pineapple is so sweet. And then when you put it in the oven, it it caramelizes, so the tops like you get that caramelized uh, sweetness on it. Man, it is so great. And then instead of parsley, you hit it with like chopped cilantro over the top to finish it. That and some Dang. salty parm. Oh man, it was so See, this good. This is a man. He's a taste maker. <laughs> no, and that's, that's good. That's something I, I would eat. It looks so freaking good when he puts it delicious. on. Pineapple on pizza, nobody wants to admit it, but occasionally is uh, very, very good. Uh, I, I did have a pizza epiphany today, though. I wanted to run this by Carlos because uh, he, he's down there too. And we talk about all this pizza that's available in uh, Broward County mostly and Let's Eat South Florida and here on the show. And, and uh, you know, Dade County has its own uh, pizza culture, I guess. But is it true that that the – and people will always say, well, geez, you can't get uh, good pizza down here. You can't get good Chinese, all of that, because uh, they're out of New York. Uh, should – with the evolution of pizza in general, I, I think I even sent Mike a couple of reels that I saw, of people pulling different types of pizza out of ovens, and they all look fantastic. I mean, it, should New York – pizza still be held as the standard by which all should be judged or is that so passe it's almost like saying the payphone should be the standard for all uh, judgment of communications devices uh i mean is, is it, the evolution of pizza has it not changed the whole concept to where you don't need to compare them anymore to to new york pizza what do you think mike i think i think uh, i think that new york style of pizza i mean new york is such an enormous influence on all food yeah. culture right that that it becomes an outsized thing but I think you know different areas have their own takes on them. Yeah, um, and, that are that are fantastic. You know, I think um, you know I I call myself a pizza agnostic in that I don't profess any loyalty above and beyond to one single style. And even in New York, look, New York is the New Yorkers have this exaggerated sense of self because they think they're at the center of the universe and that everything that it pales in comparison to to what you find there now. I grew up in Brooklyn, and the corner slice at your corner pizza joint was a staple growing up. But even in New York at the time, there was a differentiation between the old school coal fired oven places like Totono's and Patsy Grimaldi's, where they did not sell it by the slice, where it was only a full pizza that you could order, and your more kind of pedestrian you know, grab a slice as a snack in the middle of the day uh, places and of varying quality. Now, slice joints have gone into their own stratosphere, especially Miami slice. I'm talking about you with your $12 each slice for your fancy ass thing. I haven't been there yet. Kind of. I do want to try it, but like, I have been there. Philosophically, I have think? been there and it's 12 bucks and it's, a slice. Uh, wow. And there's, there's at least three other places that are making a pizza just as good. Old Greg's okay. is making a, a almost identical pizza that is just as good that you can just like get any day of the week and walk in and right. it's not you know a 45 dollar pie like a 40 <laughs> something dollar pie i am not making that up i it, it come on man even with the finest ingredients we know what goes into it it's only four things it's only high, flour high salt yeah. yeast and water that is it and none of those four things are expensive uh, but you know but the I mean? overhead, the insurance, Carlos, it's yes, killing people. Yeah. Yes. But then why are they only open four hours a day starting well, on Thursdays? I mean, FOMO. I know maybe their hours have changed. FOMO, I, I baby. Say, oh, I hate that. I hate that whole, you know how I feel about some of these trendoid Miami things. Um, but look, back in the day, there were slice joints, there were pie joints, and now we have New York pie joints, New York slice joints. We have New Haven pizza. We have Chicago deep dish and tavern style thin pizza. We have Detroit pizza, which might be my favorite all because growing up, I was a big Sicilian pizza guy and, and Detroit pizza is basically just Sicilian pizza, but with the burnt cheese over the edges of the steel pan. Oh man, I want some pizza right now. After Can I give a shout out then to yeah. um, uh, this guy? Um, oh man, he's, he took over the, the, the Harry's Pizza spot in 
uh oh what's it called i'm gonna look it up it's, it's a detroit or... style piece. no in in um at the edge of the design district oh, okay it used to be uh, michael it's... schwartz had his pizza places right right and he gave up that spot uh to focus on a different area and then it was taken over by this guy um he goes the chef he goes by the name jeremiah bullfrog uh okay and, and but he makes he's I, I don't know if he's from detroit but he was like a personal chef to like rick ross and whatever and he makes a really delicious um detroit style pizza with like lots of red sauce on it yeah like it's a very it saucy on pizza. Top of the cheese yeah, yeah. really de really delicious really good job um and, and I another give a chef kind of, i gotta and give another, a one of those great spots oh, i'm sorry i was gonna say my uh vice vice city pizza which is way out in kendall but if you're in that area it's a fantastic square pizza square style there. okay yeah. and then of course i'd like to give a shout out to uh my friends death by pizza in delray beach uh they have a killer uh detroit pie uh including the uh rooney is uh, soccer rooney whatever it's one of those pepperoni with a lot of good sauce on it but uh, yeah i've become very enamored of the detroit pieces all right we got to take another break and then we'll come back and maybe get back to michelin stars and maybe get into the whole regina's farm ethical dining we're running out of time here i got to tell everybody here about uh batch new southern kitchen and tap uh, we were there last week, and uh, we re-aired the episode uh, yesterday. Kevin Deneau, the uh, proprietor there, they just does such a great job. They're so service-focused and oriented. They want to make every guest happy, and you will be happy if you go into Batch. They're open for lunch and dinner and brunch on the weekends. They're open seven days. They have live music Wednesday through Friday in the evenings. They are at 525 North Federal Highway in Fort Lauderdale. There's free parking right next door in the garage. You could miss it, but you shouldn't because it makes the whole experience so much easier and people don't realize that you don't have to deal with the hassles of the Fort Lauderdale street parking and meters. Go in there, uh, Batch. Uh, they will take great care of you. They have, oh, man, uh, the uh, Jambalaya. What would you think of that there, Defoe? Uh, that was great. I, you know what? I had it. Uh, it was such a large portion that uh, even though I uh, ate my uh, significant share there, it probably lasted me another three, four days of uh, snacking on, and it was delicious, uh, absolutely fantastic. The food there is great, uh, and a wide variety, uh, really a terrific place, and Kevin just does a great job. I'm a big fan of his. Yeah, going to Batch, uh, on Wednesdays, they have Whiskey Wednesdays, and they also have these kind of great uh, classes uh, to learn more about the arts of uh, bourbon and whiskey. They have so many varieties there. They make their own uh, flavored whiskeys in-house, that great uh, the uh, pecan-infused uh, uh, bourbon that they use in that great drink that I always drink, those sours, the uh, pecan uh, whiskey sour. Uh, I love Batch. You will, too. Go check it out and tell them the Lunchbox sent you. Very knowledgeable and friendly staff there. I mean, uh, it sounds like a cliche, but they, they really are helpful in terms of explaining all, all the different varieties of things that, that they serve there. And, uh, you know, it, it's very diversified. Uh, you know, you think of Southern Kitchen and you're thinking a uh, certain type of food, but uh, all kinds of different things that are absolutely scrumptious. All right, coming back with more. Uh, pleasure having Carlos Frias uh, on today's uh, edition of Mike Mayo's Lunchbox. Back in a moment. Hey when the Brooklyn boy in me wants a good bagel with Nova or some matzo ball soup, homemade knishes, or a great deli pastrami sandwich on rye, you know where I go? Grandpa's Cafe in Dania Beach. It's been around a long time, an institution, but a little over a year ago, a pair of New Yorkers came in, bought it, and refurbished the place. It's beautiful, and they are now serving great breakfast, brunch, lunch. They've got the omelets. They've got Eggs Benedict. They've got all kinds of great baked goods like Ruggleich. Grandpa's is just off Federal Highway on Southwest 1st Street in Dania Beach. It's open seven days. Go in there. Tell them that the lunchbox sent you. When people come to me and say, Mike, where should I go out to eat? I got guests coming from out of town. Where should we go? Cafe Seville. That's the answer. 2768 East Oakland Park Boulevard. It's a Fort Lauderdale perennial. It's serving the finest in Spanish and continental cuisine in a cozy, friendly, comfortable setting. Joey Esposito and Sally, his better half, they've been running the place for a long time. It's been open since the 1980s. They got great Spanish classics like paella, shrimp with garlic sauce and all kinds of great seafood dishes. The stuffed veal chop, oh, that's my favorite. Go to Cafe Seville. It's open every day but Sunday at 5 p.m. for dinner. Tell them that the Lunchbox Mayo and Defoe sent you. Do you like burgers? Do you like wings? Do you like late-night food and sports on big-screen TVs and cold beer and friendly vibe and great people? 
then you want to check out Shenanigans, 1300 South Federal Highway in Dania Beach. Go to Shenanigans, you get yourself all the good stuff, the fresh fish every day, the black and grilled wings, and of course, the kitchens are open late. Go there, tell them that the Lunchbox Mayo and Defo sent you. For an exquisite sushi experience, Kaizen Sushi Bar and Grill in Fort Lauderdale is the place to go. 5640 North Federal Highway, just north of Commercial Boulevard. Chef owner Hui Lam, he's a sushi savant, slicing and serving pristine fish and seafood flown in directly from Japan and around the world. Nigiri, sashimi, special rolls, and omakase dinners. He's ruined me from going anywhere else. It's that good. Open seven days for dinner and also for lunch. Even if you're not a sushi fan, they have great cooked options, including steaks, chops, rice and noodles, and other Japanese dishes. It's fantastic. For reservations and information, go to kaizenflorida.com. Tell them Mike Mayo and the Lunchbox sent you. Delicious Mexican food with innovative twists. Margaritas with a medley of tongue-tingling flavors. I'm talking about Taco Craft, Taqueria, and Tequila Bar. The place to go on Taco Tuesday and every day. It's located at 510 North Federal and Highway in Fort Lauderdale and also in Lauderdale by the Sea at Plantation Walk and soon in Coral Springs. Taco Craft has specials every day, including bottomless drinks for a Sunday brunch and Taco Tuesdays with their $4 premium tacos, including their new Berea tacos with bone marrow broth. Oh, it's so good. They've even made a taco lover out of me and they've got so much more, including fajitas, that open face smashed cheeseburger tortilla that's new, and a guacamole sample that's an explosion of flavors. Kitchen is open late. There's delivery and takeout. For more information, go to tacocraft.com. Tell them Mike Mayo, the lunchbox sent you. All right, we're back on the lunchbox. Got Carlos Frias down below. We got uh, Jeff Defoe to Forrest to my side. And quick, uh, quick question though, uh, yeah. how did you uh, possibly? What could Carlos have written to take the Beard Award away from you in any given year when you're putting out things like tongue tingling? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you talk about a classic wordsmith, Carlos. Uh, that, that was, I mean, he just slipped that in in a commercial, for God's sake. Um, he's the it? Hamilton. He's the Hamilton of, uh, of food writers. Yeah. He's the Lin Manuel Miranda of food writers. Exactly. Like just giving it away. I do my copywriting service included with your lunchbox sponsorship. Tongue tingling. Uh, no, that was brilliant, Mike Mayo. Tongue tingling. Yeah. Tequila Can drinks. I, oh. <laughs> yeah, I so I remember the name of that pizza place. It's called Square City Pie. And that oh. Jeremiah Bullfrog, I'll tell you a funny story. Like, I recommend it despite having beef with this guy. Uh, at one point, <clears throat> I was writing about some event he was doing before he had the, the place, and he gives me his name as Jeremiah Bullfrog. And because I'm a journalist writing for the Miami Herald, I was like, okay, that's great. I, I also need your real name, you know, because because yeah. it's a newspaper, you're right. Yeah. And that man got so incensed with me uh, about using his real name that I ended up not writing a story. He, he wouldn't give it to me. Like I later well, just found it out. I'm not going to out him. Of course you can find it out. It's I in the could, public I, records. Usually yes. when you look up the, the licensing and the sun biz, I, you should have just done it my way, which is don't even ask him for his real name. Just put the real name in there when you find it and then have him get all crazy on you afterwards. Yeah. No, I wouldn't got do crazy that. on me anyway, but you know what? His, he makes good pizza. So uh, that's good. Well, it's good yeah. that you're a big enough man to admit that the food is still good. Even if you had your, personal spats with him hey uh we we just came out of the taco craft ad and uh Difa, did you hear the big news next month for our taco craft appearance we're gonna go a little bit off schedule we're gonna go out there on cinco de mayo to their plantation location oh wow that should be festive they have a huge cinco de mayo party out there we're gonna get there right when it begins a sunday at noon before it gets crazy and mark falsetto and company we're gonna be doing some cinco de mayo shots i imagine or oh. uh, sips of it's got that high-end tequila i mean I, I, I don't know. What, what's your experience with tequila, Carlos? Are, are you inclined to get like, you know, a very high end uh, shot of tequila? Because it, it is different than, you know, the old Jose Cuervo that I used to guzzle down, you know, and it's, then have to bite into a lemon and, you know, bite half your hand off with the salt. It's funny because I was just having that conversation like a week or so ago about how for a while you could only like the only tequila you could get in the U.S. was Jose, was Jose Cuervo. Like that right. was That's... or not the only, but it was the dominant one. And it's you needed to eat other things because it was so bad. And people had a bad association. <laughs> it was like with tequila. Raunchy, yeah. 
Yeah, people had a bad association with tequila because they only had Jose Cuervo and they would wake up the next morning, you know, uh, <laughs> regretting all their life choices. Well, the yeah. truth, same is true with whiskey. You drink bad whiskey, you're going to feel that for at least another day. So, like, I think, like, your base, your base tequila, like, we have uh, Himador at home. Uh, and it's like, you know, 30 bucks a bottle or whatever. And it's like your middle shelf. And, and I like using that for everything. And I, and I will have like a really nice sipping tequila. Although I'm not really into, uh, reposado, like the smokiness t- yeah, t- doesn't no, do it for me. Falsetto, uh, Mark Falsetto from Taco Crest has been turning us on to the reposados and I kind of like it. I like the smokiness, but I'm a scotch whiskey drinker. I like single malt whiskeys, whiskeys, and it reminds me of that. Yeah, I like scotch, but the smoke in it is like it's maybe it's just the one that i've had there was too just much. too much smoke in it oh he poured us some 40 dollars shot ones that was pretty darn smooth my friend Ooh, that was pretty oh. good hey, okay uh, well, we got to show up <laughs> well may 5th at the plantation taco craft you're more than welcome to join the party how could they uh, have a cinco de mayo celebration without a de la Hoya fight though <laughs> at least they're gonna have a, a mayo at the cinco de mayo all right oh that's right they got my uh, cinco de mayo that's the miami pronunciation of my name i love this i love miguel it. mayo uh we got business to take care of in the way of congratulations to this week's contest winner all right no uh, don't tell me he did it he did it no this, is, this gives me great pleasure i mean he even though he's the mascot of the show he is not an official employee in any way of the show so he is eligible to participate and uh one Jim Snar- Jim Sarney, James L. Sarney, my former colleague at the Sun Sentinel, fresh from a 30-day stint at Holy Cross Hospital. Nobody deserves it more. Congratulations, Jim. You won this week's Lunchbox 10 Palms contest. The way he did it, this was a tricky one, uh, Defo, uh, because you know how it works. Is first, you got to give the name of the restaurant. It was an easy one. It was Texas Roadhouse, or our friends right. at Texas Roadhouse. Scramble the word Texas, you get taxes which was tax day was yesterday. It was a stretch, but hey, I've done that before. It was for most people. Yes. Uh, (laughs) Then came the tricky part, the winner of the contest race at Gulfstream, the 10th race on Saturday. He got that too? No, nobody got that. It was a 16 to 1 shot, number 7, scat to tap. You're uh, telling nobody, me our audience is nothing but chalk players? There was a lot of chalk uh, going yeah. going down. But give props to Sarney because there was only two people that got the second place horse, and that it was also a long shot. I think it was a 10 to 1 shot. Number six, Sentenza. Do you know okay. what Sentenza means? Is that a, a, a given name or is that? I thought that it was a character in Godfather 2. <laughs> That's Clemenza. Watch out for Sentenza. <laughs> <laughs> number six, Sentenza was the second place horse. Two people had number six, so they went to the third tiebreaker. Is this too complicated for anybody out there? It's I don't think Carlos for- has any idea what you're talking about, but <laughs> he's, he's gracious enough to act like this uh, makes sense. So the third tiebreaker was give me the winner of the Masters and the winning margin. Well, a lot of people did pick Scotty Scheffler to win, but none of those had the correct horse. In order to advance to the third tiebreaker, you got to – get to the second tiebreaker so the it then came down to the two people who had the six horse sarney and somebody else sarney picked it, that it's like you're trying to explain the nhl playoff format now <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, is this, I mean, a, who is the this, hell is in this? <laughs> it's a 3 2 3 format with the, uh, it's it's a, a with the horse racing. Thing. Is there a All plan? Right. Tony took on? the Swedish guy, Aberg, and his uh, the other one who had uh, who was in the running took uh, DeChambeau. And so basically, it was a match uh, competition, oh, wow. and Aberg finished way ahead of DeChambeau. Aberg was the runner up. So that's a pretty good pick from Sarney there since it came in on Friday. Congratulations, Jim Sarney. You and a guest have won an all-expense Sunday brunch uh, package at Fabulous Ten Palms at Gulf Street. All right. If, um, if you want to ruin his time, just suggest that. Uh, and I had him incensed yesterday because I like to kind of irritate him now because he sends me all these texts about, uh, you know, the women's uh, NIT and things like that that I should be covering this on our shows. And uh, I, I had him going uh, by implying in Hank Goldberg fashion that uh, this was a Bush League town when it came to sports, that none of the stuff that he considers important really matters here. And I, I can't tell you, the thread of text here is, uh, oh, is, is very are you, contentious. Are you trying to put him back in the hospital? First of all, do you a think... Venomous <laughs> string of text. Do you think Sarney had a, a like a chalkboard with every WNBA potential draftee and was following... Uh, my mock draft was ruined when they took Caitlin Clark number one. Who would have anticipated would have that? that? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, can um, we just say, like, I... I was watching the NBA 
draft, the WNBA, WNBA draft. draft. That's incredible. Yeah. And, for how and long? I'm, and I'm yeah. watching for for the entirety of it. I was at no. Flanagan's, like eating some food and like watch. And there was the that in the Marlins game. And let me tell you, it was more entertaining than the Marlins game. Um, Marlins game has been great though because uh, we bet the under on a recommendation of a friend of ours uh, under the season total of seventy eight and a hook. So the Marlins now have to play like 600 baseball the rest of the way to even come close. And we know that's not happening. You could run to the windows and cash that ticket. The question about the Marlins, though, Defoe and Carlos, is when are we going and buying some of those all-you-can-eat seats, uh, not eating seats? Why don't we try that? Should we apply for a freebie on that one, uh, Mike? I mean, I don't want a freebie. I'll pay the 52 bucks and just try to see how much I can do. It could make for a good uh, reel or something. You personally could be the one that finally puts the nail in the coffin on the Marlins franchise (laughs) by eating them out of Miami. How many hot dogs <laughs> would it take to cause you bring bankruptcy? Joey Chestnut with you for the four for 54 or whatever? Sherman and <laughs> company. Mike's going to beat the house oh, on it for man. sure. Hey, um, look, before we go to the final break, I did want to get back to uh, Michelin. Is, is there anybody? I was really pleased when they first came out because a lot of what they ended up choosing aligned with what I think is the best in town. And a lot of it was happily skewed towards local chefs who are doing kind of Miami, you know, things as opposed to just outposts of famous brand names, you know, and those did make it, you know, they gave the nod to the, uh, what is it? The, uh, um, uh, the guy, uh, the, um, why am I blanking on his name? The fancy French chef, the only one that has two stars. In, oh, uh, uh, the the late Joel Robuchon. Joel Robuchon, le Italien de Joel Robuchon. Sounds like and, a defenseman for the Panthers, and, doesn't and, it? <laughs> yes, and uh, Thomas <laughs> Keller's place, and, and Coates or Cody or Greg Cody or however they pronounce the Korean bar, which by the way is excellent. But you know they did include places like Ariette and our friend Mike Belcher, who does great stuff, and they did include Boyade, which is one of my favorite spots. And you talk about how places react after getting the stars. I went back to Boya Day a couple of months ago. It is still great. It has not lost its kind of kind of cutting edge vibe. It's in a part of town you wouldn't expect. And they're just doing great things there. And the food is remained top level. So I'm glad that Boya Day, um, you know, hasn't lost its way since getting, you know, crushed with the, uh, you know, a lot of people come in every night, which is a great thing for those. Yeah, they open, they open a second place, something called well, Walrus Rodeo, whatever that is. It's- and I went there and I ate the whole menu with the Phil and Kate from the Fort Lauderdale, the greater greater what do we call it visit lauderdale food wine festival we we went in there and there was some really good dishes and there was some yeah but uh but at least they're still innovating and do things but uh, what do you think okay carlos what do you think is going to be in the running is anything going to drop just real quickly before we get out of here and actually we got to do a final break too so i think there's a there's a restaurant by the the, the only restaurant right now by the Changs, the Chang family that had Itame, uh, is called Mati's, M-A-T-Y yep. apostrophe S. And that's, you know, that chef has been on all the lists and everything else. And that what restaurant, was their I original to it. The place was inside the food hall there. The uh... It was called Itame. Itame, that's right. Itame. Yes. It was in the food hall, then just outside the yes. food hall. And now... Uh, and it's now gonna it's Mighty, Maite's, which is Ma- also... Maddie, for... it, Maddie's. It Maddie's. looks like Maddie's. Okay. And you Matthews. get you, call, you got to call him the Chang Gang. I think that's uh, the required Chang by law. You have to call him the Chang Gang. Yeah, father, daughter, and son are all um, a great, great chefs, and they originally from Peru. And do yeah, chef. and even Patel has a new place called Erba, which is kind of like Italian. Uh, there's some Italian influences along with his like Indian cooking, and I think that that place uh, will probably it, it that should be on the list. I think that place will probably be. Uh, we'll probably get a start unless it hasn't been open long enough. That might be the case too. Although the Michelin recently gave a uh, like a nod, like a recommendation to a place that is that was closed, that had been closed for days, at if not longer, uh, <laughs> on their list, and it's still there. It's still on their list. It just says temporarily closed. Which and one? I'm telling you, they've already. It's called Pez. Pez okay. P E Z. And it's already had a. It had the drinking pig pop up inside of it, and that has closed so that. So you that, know that uh, restaurant Rahim, hasn't been there. That, yeah, that place hasn't been there in two iterations. I got, so I got some news. Um, first of all, Raheem says hello to you when I when he heard that I was going to be uh, having oh, you on the show today. Him. Raheem Seely, the very talented chef who was behind the Drinking Pig pop up barbecue. Some good news. I mean, I'm going to just let it out of the bag. They're looking. He's looking. T- besides opening this JNC Oyster on Harrison Street in Hollywood, they're looking to put a Drinking Pig brick and mortar on the same street. And have him run both. Um, they are actively. That looking. is huge. 
Yeah. That is huge. These are the nuggets that you get, Jeff Defo DeForest, only on the lunchbox. So um, this is why if you are one of It's like meal. scooping out the inside of a bagel, man. You got to <laughs> scoop on everything. <laughs> um, so uh, Raheem says hello and wow. mentioning places that, uh, you know, that are in guides but are no longer open. That brings me to uh, it was kind of the curiosity. I've been watching the new season of Check, Please, South Florida. We had our good friend Kaizen Kui uh, was featured in the season opener with our friend Dr. Nick. Uh, you might see somebody familiar in the season finale on June 4th with uh, the uh, great uh, Tim and Baloo and the Catherine restaurant. But last night they featured a couple of places including Flamingo Seafood which is right across the street from our friend Ken's uh, The Foundry. But Flamingo Seafood opened in a former gas station. They spotlighted it last night. The only problem is it's been closed about two months and... Uh, <laughs> People have been texting me with various, uh, uh, I guess, theories about why the place went down. Um, but uh, uh, all I know is that it's not open. So it's kind of odd that they didn't either kind of remove that segment and fill it in with a repeat or just mention that it's no longer open. But such are the vagaries of TV. All right. Uh, I'm going like to shut up. Put in, you have to put in one phone call and just be like, hey, still <laughs> open, right? You know what I mean? Like, I okay, was always checking. I would usually do that before putting together my Mother's Day guide or whatever it was coming up. Yes. All right. Let's take our last break, and then we'll get out of here uh, on a extended edition overtime of the Lunchbox after these words. For Gilbert's 17th Street Grill, you know me. I love family-run places with quality food at fair prices served with passion and pride. And that's why I love Gilbert's. For more than a decade, Lenore, Beth, and Richie Gilbert have been serving up the best burgers, wings, ribs, salads, and desserts. It's a fast, casual spot. Everything prepared fresh to order from an immaculate open kitchen. They're at 1821 Cordova Road in Fort Lauderdale in the Cordova shops just south of 17th Street. Open every day but Sunday. One of my favorite burgers in South Florida. Big, round, juicy pucks of 100% Angus beef, char grilled to perfection. And don't miss the sweet potato fries on the side. They're legendary. Go to Gilbert's, feast, and be happy. Tell them the Lunchbox sent you. When I'm looking for some wicked good food for a wicked good lunch, there's only one place to go. That's Wicked Cheesesteaks in Fort Lauderdale. It's at 4824 North Federal Highway, just south of Commercial Boulevard and across from Holy Cross Hospital. My friend Brian there, he will hook you up with some really tasty treats. They've got cheesesteaks, just like the best you can find in Philly, along with lobster rolls, because that's where he's from, Maine originally. And they have wings and pizza and everything you want to have a really good time. Wicked Cheese steaks they're open every day but tuesday check them out online wickedcheesesteaks.com tell them the lunchbox sent you if you're looking for a great place for steaks seafood and more go to tropical acres steakhouse and butcher shop it's at 2500 griffin road in dania just west of i-95 in the airport they've been there a long time since 1949 that means they're doing something right You'll get old school hospitality from the Studio Alley family, along with great value for tremendous service. Of course, you could also go into the bar for happy hour every day, four to six, and they have great value all night long. Also, a butcher shop that's open every day from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., except Sunday. The dining room is open every day at 4 30, except Sunday. Go to Tropical Acres, tell them the lunchbox sent you. Fish, a sophisticated setting. I'm talking about Corvina Seafood Grill. It's at 110 Plaza Real South in Boca Raton, just south of Palmetto Park Road. It's the place to go for the freshest and local seafood and fish, some of it with a Peruvian twist like their great ceviches. It's open seven days for dinner. They also have happy hours seven days a week. You don't want to miss it. It's a great place. CorvinaBocaRaton.com for more information and reservations. Tell them the Lunchbox sent you. All right, we're back on the lunchbox with Carlos Frias and Jeff DeForest. Mike Lubitz, hopefully enjoying his vacation in the Dominican Republic. Uh, we're in overtime quickly. Let's go to sports. Speaking of overtime, what do you think? Heat playing. Uh, when does it start? What's happening? Are they playing with fire once again? Because last year uh, they barely... They're going on a road and uh, play Philadelphia tomorrow night. That'll be the uh, early game. Not an easy assignment. Uh, and Bede came back. He's like an animal now. So uh, that, that went from uh, looking like a possibility to looking like a loss. And uh, then they would have to play uh, the winner of the uh, Chicago game against Atlanta. 
So very similar uh, in, in a sense to what we saw last year, where last year they lost to the Hawks in the first game and then had to beat Chicago after trailing late and then made it all the way to the finals. But uh, yeah, that gets on away. It gets on away tonight, actually, with two good West Coast matchups. Uh, very difficult to predict. Got the Lakers Arlington. in New Orleans uh, against the Pelicans uh, and uh, Golden State on the road against Sacramento. That's yeah, Golden State in the play, and that's uh, that's something. Uh, Carlos, do you have any thoughts on the Heat? Uh, uh, yeah, I actually, I was I was watching uh, on the on the show. Uh, um, uh, was it uh, Pablo Torre finds out yeah. that he found the video of how they tried to pitch LeBron James to go to the Knicks, and it's the the cringiest, most embarrassing thing. Like I can imagine him going from that meeting where they got the Sopranos to like uh, they had Jim Gandolfini and Edie Falco read this terrible script like convincing lebron uh that he should go <laughs> come house shopping and what it got me to thinking would you want do you think the heat would ever be interested in bringing lebron back to miami if it meant drafting Bronny at 15 which is like a 15 <laughs> number 15 draft pick isn't like a fantastic pick anyway wouldn't you draft Bronny at 15 and and get lebron james back for the rest of his career Hmm. I don't know. Do you think the kid's going to be as good as the father? I mean, Steph Curry, obviously no. his dad was no. Del Curry and it was better than his father, an NBA player. I and then again, we have the uh, instances of uh, Jack Nicholas's kids uh, and not one of them turned out to be uh, a golfer. The bear with a lick. So no. um, I don't know. I don't know where that leads. Well, I, I'm going on record, though. Heat's not making it through the plan. They're going to lose one of these. Uh, they're going to lose two games in a row. Uh, they're wow. playing with fire, and they and 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 not with uh, in a good way. Uh, I don't, I just don't have a good vibe about them. You know, they got lucky last year, and they came in as the number eight seed, and they went all the way to the finals uh, last year. Can you believe it or not? The Panthers, same thing, eight seed, knock off the the President's Cup winners or whatever, a President Trophy winner, the Bruins in the first round, and they went all the way. Uh, I am very bullish on the Panthers this year. And you know me, Defoe. I love to hate the Panthers. Well, at least the Panthers organization and brass. But this team, you got to love, right? Do you do you love them? Or, uh, you oh, like me? Oh, oh, I, yeah. <laughs> I got lost there. I thought you were signing I off. don't know what I'm doing yeah, anymore. Yeah, you're gone there, Mayo. I mean, uh, <laughs> there, they're calling I, me. They're calling you. All right, you yeah. can drop, Defoe. Uh, everybody else, Carlos, thank you so much for coming on. We didn't get to my discussion about uh, ethical eating or um, if you go to a place and maybe you don't agree with everything uh, that maybe uh, uh, all your money might not be going to places or causes that you agree with. Um, do you go? Do you not go? Do you just assess it by the food? But that's another topic for another day. We'll have plenty of other days ahead. But I do want to mention that uh, the place uh, that I wrote about on Let's Eat it's called Regina's Farm. It's usually like a four-year waiting list. It's uh, Saturdays only. They only do it 32 Saturdays a year because it's too hot in the summertime. It's a lovely setting in uh, Fort Lauderdale, kind of a rustic, uh, kind of a Brazilian farm atmosphere, home-cooked meals. And I'm proud to be co-hosting a special event that's going to be benefiting the George Snow Scholarship Fund in conjunction with our friends at Red Meat Lovers Club, Evan Garnell. And that's going to be April 27th. So you don't have to wait three or four years. You just only have to wait a couple of weeks. And yeah, is it cutting a line? Well, you know, it's like people go to Disney World and they buy the Speed Pass or whatever you call it. So uh, it's for a good cause. It's at premium pricing. So it's $165 to get in. But they have some extras like a open bar and a cigar bar and some extra meaty options, uh, some steaks and things that they don't usually have there. So if you want to get in, uh, involved on that night, just go to redmeatloversclub.com uh, or selflessdinner.com. Com. That's selflessdinner.com. Again, it's going towards uh, uh, part of the proceeds to the George Snow Scholarships Fund, and uh, I'll be happy to be taking part and eating and uh, drinking some good stuff. All right, that's the final word for today. Carlos, any parting thoughts? Uh, sorry for keeping a little bit extra. Sometimes we just can't help ourselves. We got so I enjoyed all the pizza talk, and I'm going to give a final shout out to Mr. O1 on hidden inside of a building on South Beach with six tables as my favorite Miami pizza. 
Nice. That was the original. Now, what happened? He's gotten like some VC, you know, some equity, private equity money, because these Mr. O1s are popping up all over the state. I've eaten them in one out in uh, like uh, Bonita Springs in the Naples area. Right? And in other countries, too. But I know that if you go to that one on South Beach every now and then, he's actually still there. If he's still making pies. The pies. It's extraordinary. Yeah. The yeah. ones I've had have been Mr. O1 average to above average. Uh, go to that spot. Go to okay. that spot. The original yeah. sometimes is uh, is the original for a reason. Any parting thoughts, Jeff D. for the forest? Good luck to everybody, all of you. <laughs> That's it. All right, we're out of here. <laughs> Thanks best. for tuning in. No music, but enjoy everything.